Hello, it's Scott Manley here with a very special video to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Elite. Elite is, of course, one of the most important video games in spaceship gaming history. So it is, of course, important that I uh, take a moment to remember this and to uh, show you how things used to be. Now, this is an emulation of a BBC Model B microcomputer with a disk drive that had a 2 megahertz processor and about 32 kilobytes of memory. So Modern computers are running around 2,000 times faster in terms of just clock speed, and it ha they have about 500,000 times the amount of memory. Um, and of course, when I say clock speed, you have to remember this is an 8-bit processor. Modern processors now, are now running on a 64-bit data bus, so they move 8 times as much data with each clock cycle. Um, yeah, this is Elite is an exercise in making, um, in fitting a gallon into a pint pot, as they say, and it was very innovative for its time. So there's no UI, there's no point and click UI. That was just getting popularized by the Macintosh, which was also released in 1984. But the BBC was still following the text interface, so I type commands such as cat, and it tells me that I have a disk and drive zero that has something called Elite on it. Now I'm going to run it. Run, boot, and it's going to load up and we're going to see what the game's like. Now I should point out I'm having to kind of rush this through because 20th of September, it's also my wedding anniversary and I have to rush this off before I disappear on holiday. <laughs> um, which explains perhaps if I make some, some mistakes here. Okay, so load new commander. We have the screen here and I kind of want to talk about this spacecraft. This is the Cobra Mark III, the spacecraft you are supposed to fly in the game. You will recognize, if you've been looking at Elite Dangerous, that this bears a striking resemblance to the Cobra Mark III in that game. Of course, they have a common lineage, right? And yeah, you know, it does look rather triangular because that was the kind of the elements they had to work with. All the spacecraft are mirrored so that they only have to store the vertices once they, and then they duplicate them. And the graphics are flickery because the drawing system, they can't afford double buffering or anything. What they do is they would draw the line uh, in white and then they would undraw the line. And actually it's more, it's slightly more complicated than that. When they're drawing the line, they're filling in each pixel one at a time. And what they're doing is an XOR operation, which means if the pixel is white, they make it black. And if it's black, they make it white. So if you draw the line once, it goes white, and then if you draw the line again, it goes black. This was obviously a way to save on memory and a code, right? It minimized the amount of code that you had to write and therefore let you free up memory and make things faster. So you can see, for example, where the lines cross at vertices. Sometimes those spots are black because if you have two lines drawing over each other, then they will obliterate. And you'll see that a lot. Anyway, I'm going to actually load up a commander. We can take a look at the disk catalog in drive zero. And you have Mike up the top. So let's load new commander. Commander is going to be Mike. I-K-E. -E. Uh, why is K not working? K-E. There we go. It's a l I'm typing too fast for this ancient computer, which drive drive zero. Press space or fire, Commander. Look, there is the crate. Now, in the original Elite, you could not get any other ship other than the Cobra Mark III. But you could see all the other ships and blow them up. So here I am. I am in the system of JAMA. I have a ton of cash, which is why I loaded this, rather than the standard Commander Jameson, which has 100 credits. Uh, we can look at the galaxy. You see the galaxy is... Huge! This is Galaxy 2, and you have, I think, 256 stars in each galaxy. I could be wrong there. They were all procedurally generated. And uh, the text, that you have uh, little parameters, tells you all about the each system here. So this is a poor agricultural uh, anarchy. It has a tech level of 1 with 0.8 billion human colonials and a gross productivity of 768 mega credits. But best of all is the flavor text at the bottom, which is of course also procedurally generated. The world of Jema is reasonably noted for mud tennis and the Jemian evil poet. If you've played Kerbal Space Program and have looked at the mission descriptions, you might find some echoes here. Let's uh, take a look at some of the other ones. We have... Esraustis, whatever. This is the planet Esraustis is Ezra Sose. 
Ah, it's like Ez Ezra Sose is a boring world. And oh yeah, and populated by small, harmless, slimy frogs. Again, just chaining those adjectives together. This world is mostly fabled for the Beninian lethal brandy, but scourged by deadly tree ants. Uh, where we go here? Onelia, Onella. This world is plagued by occasional solar activity. So this is a rich industrial system. Let's go there. So this is a space trading game. They didn't have high... They purposely stayed away from three lives and high scores, which they kept on getting told they needed to have. So I'm not going to buy food, not going to buy textiles, reading out sleep. Oh, yes, alcohol. Let's buy 35 tons of alcohol. Great. That's what I want. Now let's get ourselves headed off into space. Uh, so I think I press F10 to launch. And just see a little bit of an animation. Here we go. Now this is all keyboard controls. So space accelerates. Aha. Uh -huh. And slash slows down. So I can accelerate a bit and turn around and look at the station. The Coriolis Starport, which I'm sure you're intimately familiar with by now. And I believe rear view, front view, left, right view. So you can see out of various... Uh, whatever positions you like here. I can fly around it, I could shoot it if I like, but what I'm going to do is jump into hyperspace to Onella. It's 4, 3, 2, 1! Woo! Super hyperdrive. Whoa, now I've got to fly across there, and that sound effect in the background is a blender. Ooh, so I did my jump drive, that is super cruise essentially. And it looks like there's a bunch of spacecraft. Oh, and they're shooting me! Uh oh. I gotta start shooting at these guys. Okay, come on. Okay, this is gonna be some piracy. No targeting uh, computers in these days. And no lateral controls either. We still have the roll and pitch limits. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Come on, come on. Oh. So you still had to roll towards the target. Ah! Brilliant. At least these things don't have shields that regenerate, because that would make things hard. These are crate pirates, and I am using beam lasers on them, so I should have the bit of an upper hand here, because I can fire pretty fast. If I was with a pulse laser, I might find myself in some trouble. Okay, come on. Uh, I wish I had lateral controls here. Yes! That's one of them down. Come on, who's next? You can see at the bottom of the screen the the radar display, which was at its time considered quite innovative. This was probably one of the first spacecraft, first games to use this kind of uh, display. This is a Sidewinder here, which again you'll recognize from Elite uh, Dangerous. Okay, I'm going to try and get in behind him. Yes, the newbie dies, succumbs to my lasers. Ah, I'm glad to see that my combat skills are not completely terrible. And where did that, that one go? Okay, this is another pirate. Oh, that is that is some fancy sounding laser effects there. I'm not sure what kind of spaceship that is. I kind of want to get closer to see it. I should fly faster. It actually looks like it might be a gecko. But I may be forgetting, they, they had a lot of different spacecraft in the game for the time, but as I said, they shared, they saved memory by only copying the, half of the spaceship and then rendering both sides mirror images. Everything in the game was an exercise in trying to fit things into the memory and make things fast. And they ported it to a lot of other platforms, and each platform had different uh, trade-offs. For example, the Commodore 64 had a slower CPU, but more memory, so they used more lookup tables for the mathematics. Is that...? Yeah, this is an ASP. This is good, we get to see everything here. This is the ASP Explorer. Oh man, is that... Oh no! ECM! That's the ECM, which is supposed to blow up missiles. I can't believe I'm just getting so many pirates here. What the heck? Why are there so many pirates coming my way? Is it because they want all the alcohol in my uh, cargo bay? Yeah, it was also, uh, at the time, there were some, like, minor people complaining about things like narcotics being available for sale. You'll... Oh... 
I thought this was supposed to be a relatively secure system, but apparently not. Apparently I am having to fight my way through this. I'm not wanting to use my energy bomb just yet. Because that would that would obliterate everyone. Oh, yes. Ah, oh, come on. Where are you? Okay, here we go. Crate for the kill. I think I'm getting better at this. Adjusting for its archaic nature. So, yeah. Uh, it was ported to a lot of every platform of the era, basically. It was ported to the Spectrum, the Commodore 64, the Amstrad, even ported to things like the MSX, I believe. I'm not sure if there was a Dragon 32 version, but I would not be surprised. Uh, they all had slightly different ver slightly different missions and things like that. For example, they had to save memory in some cases, and so they would have a smaller ship list. Some versions would have missions which weren't in other versions. So, depending upon how you were doing, you would sometimes get special missions that would let you access uh, special items, such as in your naval energy units, ECM jammers, cloaking devices. But not every version had the same missions. Which was pretty cool, actually, because it did lend a little bit of platform wars to things. Let's see, I also played 16-bit versions on the IBM, uh, the, the Atari ST, and the Commodore Amiga, and it was ported to the NES, which some people consider to be the best version, is the, the NES version. Okay, are we going here? Let's jump towards... Why is it not letting me jump? I'm running at full speed. J... Nope. I don't see any bad guys around. And... Okay, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I don't see any hostiles, so I guess I'm just waiting for myself to get close enough to the planet, which is rotating at some ridiculous speed. Obviously, they tried to add some sort of surface detail to make the planet, you know, look uh, more than simply a circle. Incidentally, I think if you look out of my rear window... Uh, no, I can't see it in this one. I thought I would be able to see a sun in my rear window. They added, they had fuel scoops, you could get go to the sun and scoop fuel from them, so you could uh, travel without paying for fuel. But more importantly, the fuel scoops, of course, allowed you to scoop cargo. Okay, now my energy cells are, are, re, uh, are filling up, rejuvenated, let's say. Uh, perhaps uh, that's why I can't move in. I think I just have to get in close enough so that I can get to see the space station and then I will have to go and try and dock with it. And probably die because dying or the docking was not a trivial experience by any means. Although I probably have the docking computer now I think about it. I might just skip that whole process. Where is the space station? Wow, I spent so much of my time doing this as a teenager. I, it literally was the game that really made me want to start writing computer games and writing software. And I learned how it worked. I learned how it's procedural generation, it's random number generation, all that stuff. I learned how all of that stuff worked. And that kind of ultimately led to me learning to write code professionally and, and my career, which uh, brought me out to California. So this, this game did literally change my life. Aha, now we have the space station, and you'll see the compass is still there. So we should be able to see the space station. And there it is there, off in the distance. It is just a mess of pixels, but it is visible as a rotating object. So I think, I wonder if C is the docking computer. I, I hope, <laughs> gotta make sure I press the right thing. Let's try C. Nope. C, oh, docking computer's on. So it's gonna try and dock. Why is it slowing down? I don't want to do that. I'm going to go faster. Let's go to full speed. Oh, I can't turn it off now, apparently. Oh, well. So, let's see. The game was released on September 20th, uh, to, um, 1984, which is 30 years ago. Elite Dangerous is still in beta. And uh, presumably they will have some updates to celebrate this. I'm very excited about Elite Dangerous because everything I've played about it just feels right. Uh, it does feel a little bare right now because it is a beta and uh, content will be one of these things that comes. But the flight model I just I think is great. Obviously I feel a little bit conflicted because clearly they have put 
physics behind gameplay, but it is a game, so I don't mind if gameplay takes uh, takes priority over the laws of physics. Oh look, this is a dodecahedron stage station. This is a 12-sided version of the station, which is not actually in the current game at this time, but maybe we will... It's not in Elite Dangerous, but maybe we will get to see it. Uh, the computer is taking me in there. There is a great talk to look up. It's GDC like 2011 or something, where David Braben talks about developing Elite. He obviously, he also developed with Ian Bell. I have to point out, Ian Bell was just as important to the original Elite, but when it came time to work on the sequel, um, it, Ian Bell had kind of lost interest. Oh dear, is that going to work? What's going on here? Oh, brilliant. Okay. Whew. Docked safely. And there's a docking bay. Oh, incoming message. And a new spaceship. What is this? This is something mysterious. Some new kind of ship I have never seen before. This is one of the missions. Greetings, Commander Mike. I am Captain... No, wait, I did this, Scott. I've got to do this like an Englishman, right? Greetings, Commander Mike. I am Captain Fosdyke Smith of Her Majesty's Space Navy, and I beg a moment of your valuable time. We would like you to do a little job for us. The ship you see here is a new model, the Constrictor, equipped with a top-secret new shield generator. Unfortunately, it's been stolen. It went missing from our shipyard on Zia five months ago, and is believed to have jumped to this galaxy. Your mission, should you choose to decide to accept it, is to seek and destroy this ship. You are cautioned that only military lasers will penetrate the new shields, and that the Constrictor is fitted with an ECM system. Good luck, Commander. Message ends. Great. Well, um, I guess what I do, quantity of food, I don't, I can't, don't, I don't have to sell stuff. Uh, inventory, sell cargo, yes, sell it all. Brilliant, and I would have made a profit, obviously, in theory on that. So, yeah, I'd love to go on and find this guy and kill him, but I do actually have to go off uh, for wedding anniversary. So, yeah, congratulations to Elite for inspiring us all and inspiring many, many games that followed in its wake. And uh, I hope everyone continues... To, I hope Delete Dangerous continues to be awesome. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.